The Acts of the Apostles, presented by Professor Bart D. Ehrman. Now that we're halfway through our course on the New Testament, it's time to move beyond our discussion of Jesus and the Gospels. It's been appropriate to spend half of our course on the first four books of the New Testament because in terms of total bulk, they make up more than half of the uh, New Testament itself. But there are 23 other books that we need to consider. In this lecture, we're going to consider the fifth book of the New Testament, the book of Acts, which picks up the story after Jesus' death and resurrection and begins to narrate an account of the spread of Christianity by Jesus' apostles after his death. This account of church history, the earliest account we have of the events that transpired after Jesus' death as Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire. The account comes from the same author who wrote our third gospel, traditionally called Luke. It's somewhat unfortunate that the third gospel and the book of Acts have been separated within our canon by the gospel of John. The sequence of our gospels, uh, in our English Bibles at least, is determined to some extent by the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, even though in the Greek manuscripts there are different sequences for our gospels. In most of the uh, manuscripts we have, the Gospel of John is last, probably because most people thought the Gospel of John was the last book to have been written among the Gospels. But the unfortunate uh, result of that is that Acts is separated from its companion volume, the book of Luke. We don't know, of course, who the author of this book was. Like the Gospel, the book of Acts is anonymous. There was, though, an early Christian tradition that said that both Luke and Acts were written by a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. There is, in fact, some evidence to suggest that the book of Acts was written by one of Paul's traveling companions. This would be a significant uh, conclusion to draw precisely because Paul is the main character of the book of Acts. And so if one of his traveling companions wrote this narrative, you would expect it to have particular credence as a historical document. The evidence comes in four passages in the book of Acts where the author stops talking in the third person about what Paul and other people were doing and begins to talk in the first person about what we were doing. Four passages in the book of Acts that are called the we passages. Who is this person who is uh, accompanying Paul on some of his journeys who discusses himself as, uh, as one of his companions? Well, one of the principal concerns of the book of Acts, of course, as I've indicated in an earlier lecture, is the spread of Christianity outside of the realm of Judaism to the realm of the Gentiles. Christianity is taken outside of Judaism it becomes a religion of Gentiles. Well, so the companion of Paul would be somebody who's interested in Gentiles. Possibly he himself is a Gentile. What Gentile companions of Paul do we know about? In Paul's own letters, he mentions several of his traveling companions. One of them is a person named Luke that Paul, in the book of Colossians, calls the beloved physician. The tradition, then, is that it was this person, the beloved physician, Luke, who was Paul's traveling companion, who produced the book of Acts. There's some evidence for it in these four we passages. Unfortunately, Luke himself is never mentioned in the book of Acts. The author doesn't say that he uh, was Luke. Moreover, these we passages are not completely convincing as evidence that a traveling companion of Paul wrote this book. When you look at these wee passages, for example, in chapter 16 of the book of Acts, they begin very abruptly, right, almost right in the middle of a sentence, and they end very abruptly right in the middle of a sentence. In other words, it, uh, the author doesn't say, and then I joined up with Paul, and we did this, that, or the other thing. Suddenly, in the middle of the narrative, the author starts saying, we. Some scholars suspect that what's going on is that the author has had available to him some sources, much as he had sources available for uh, the Gospels, and that he's incorporated these sources in his narrative 
of Paul's activities and that one of these sources may have been some kind of travel diary or travelogue by one of Paul's companions that is simply incorporated wholesale into the narrative. That would explain why suddenly he begins to say we, because that's where this new source picks up, so that on four occasions he would have been using this travelogue as, uh, as one of his sources. If that's the case, then in fact, these we passages don't indicate that the entire thing was written by one of Paul's traveling companions. There's nothing in the text, again, to suggest that it happened to be uh, somebody named Luke, and nothing about the document that suggests it happened to be written by a physician. One thing is correct, though, about this early Christian tradition that, it was, that the uh, book was written by one of Paul's traveling companions, namely, that Paul himself is the clear hero of this narrative. Paul is the man who is most responsible for the spread of Christianity throughout the Roman world, even though Paul himself was not one of Jesus' own disciples. The book is called the Acts, sometimes called the Acts of the Apostles. This title for the book is probably a bit of a misnomer. The apostles as a whole, or as a group, simply don't figure prominently in this book. They are mentioned at the outset, the uh, 11 apostles, and then there's an election to replace Judas, who has died. So there are 12 apostles, but the 12 don't figure prominently in the book. The main players in this book are Peter in chapters 1 through 12, and then Paul in chapters 13 through 28. In another sense, though, for this author, the real player is the Holy Spirit who is seen directing all of the action behind the scenes. Since this is a narrative of the spread of Christianity, I'd like to introduce the book by discussing the flow of the narrative, what actually happens in the course of the book. In terms of its overarching structure and many of its themes, we have a very nice introduction to what's going to happen in the opening episode of the book, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In this opening episode, we're told that Jesus has been raised from the dead and that he meets with his apostles before ascending into heaven. They've been staying in Jerusalem. Jesus meets with them after he's been raised from the dead, and he tells them that they need to wait because they are going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The disciples want to know, Lord, is this the time that you will now restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, is the kingdom of God going to come now? And Jesus replies, it's not up to you to know the times or the, uh, or the seasons when the kingdom will come. Instead, you need to uh, wait to receive power from on high. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and, chapter 1, verse 8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is a kind of outline for what happens in the book of Acts. The apostles are going to receive empowerment from the Spirit, and they're going to be Jesus' witnesses spreading his good news, first in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth, to the Gentile lands. When Jesus says this, then, they are looking upon him, and he is lifted up, he ascends into heaven, a cloud takes, them, takes him from their sight. Uh, two men appear, these may be angels, who say, uh, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come back again in the same way as you saw him go. So Jesus is going to return, but it's not going to happen right away. Well, as is predicted in these early verses of the book of Acts, uh, the narrative uh, goes on to describe the events. Fifty days later, on the day of Pentecost, uh, this is the day of Pentecost is named Pentecost, because the word penta, fi five, uh, for 50 days. This is a festival that takes place 50 days after the Passover. Jesus is killed during the Passover. Fifty days later, during the festival of the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit does come upon the apostles. Uh, they are gathered together. Uh, the Spirit descends upon them. 
they see flames, uh, looks like tongues of fire over their heads. They begin speaking foreign languages that they don't know. People who are gathered in Jerusalem, Jews from all over the world gathered together, hear the gospel preached in their own languages. The Spirit empowers the apostles to preach the message in the languages of these other people, and many people then convert. This is the beginning, then, of the Christian church. The apostles go about preaching their message and converting thousands of people. Masses of people convert at their preaching because of their empowerment through the Spirit. Chapter 2, verse 41, 3,000 people convert at one time. Chapter 4, verse 4, 5,000 more people convert. Chapter 5, verse 14, many more people convert. Thousands upon thousands of people converting in Jerusalem. These people are not just disparate converts who uh, then go off on their own way. The apostles organize the communities of believers uh, who then gather together for worship and fellowship. Moreover, these communities in Jerusalem all share their goods in common. They sell what they own, they contribute to a common uh, pool, and then they live communally together. Chapter 2, verses 43 to 47. The Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, according to this account, account, don't much like the fact that the Christians are having such, such success. They thought that they had gotten rid of the problem by having Jesus executed. But in fact, Jesus' apostles attract more crowds, obviously, than even Jesus did. And so, in this narrative, we're told that the Jewish leaders try to silence the apostles. They imprison them. They order them to silence. But nothing can stop them. Eventually, the Jewish leaders drive the apostles out of Jerusalem, uh, thinking that that will slow down their, uh, the progress of their mission. But in fact, rather than slowing it down, this accelerates the Christian mission because now the apostles are forced to take their message to other lands. Among all of the early converts in this book, the most significant is a former persecutor of the Christians. The Pharisaically trained and highly influential Saul, who is also known as Paul. Uh, people sometimes mistakenly think that uh, Saul was uh, this person's name, and that when he converted, he became, became Paul. Uh, that's not quite right. His, his Hebrew name is Saul. His Greek name is Paul. Uh, just two different languages. This fellow, Saul, was a persecutor of the Christians, uh, who was a Pharisee himself, on one of his trips outside of Jerusalem to persecute the Christians, he was going to the city of Damascus. And according to chapter 9 of the book of Acts, he has a vision of Jesus himself and becomes an ardent believer. Paul then becomes a great missionary to the Gentiles, going on three missionary journeys in this book. A good deal of this book... Uh, has to, uh, has to do with Paul's missionary journeys to Syria, Asia Minor, uh, which is modern-day Turkey, uh, Macedonia, and Achaia, modern-day Greece. A major conflict emerges within the Christian churches uh, as a result of Paul's missions to the Gentiles over whether Gentiles, that is non-Jews, should be required to convert to Judaism if they are to be followers of Jesus. Most specifically, the question is, do Gentile men have to be circumcised and thereby join the Jewish religion before becoming members of the Christian church? Paul is converting people, Gentiles, to be Christians without being Jews. Other people are saying that, of course, this is a Jewish religion. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah sent from the Jewish God in fulfillment of the Jewish law, and so anybody who belongs to this religion has to be Jewish. And so there's a controversy. The controversy is resolved in chapter 15 of this book when Paul and his companion Barnabas go to Jerusalem to confer with the apostles about the matter. Uh, there's a major conference there, and everybody at the conference agrees to endorse Paul's view that salvation comes to all people whether they're circumcised or not, that circumcision is not necessary uh, for salvation. Uh, there, were, uh, there was great rejoicing uh, among the Gentile believers uh, at the conclusion of this conference. Paul arouses significant opposition. 
among Jews in his mission, uh, Jews in the various cities to which he goes. Uh, in addition to converting people, he, uh, he has uh, people that he uh, makes uh, irate. They uh, persecute him in a variety of ways, uh, driving him out of town, sometimes actually uh, flogging him or stoning him. Eventually, at the instigation of his Jewish opponents, Paul is arrested uh, as a troublemaker in Jerusalem in chapter 21. And the rest of the narrative, chapters 21 through 28, uh, shows Paul on trial on various occasions, defending himself as someone who has never renounced Judaism or created any problems for the state. Paul's Roman judges are invariably convinced by his defense, but they refuse to release him for fear of the Jewish reaction. At the end of the book, Paul is sent to Rome to stand trial before the emperor. The book concludes then with him in Rome under house arrest preaching the gospel to everyone who will come near him. So, the, gospel, the, uh, the book of Acts begins with Jesus saying that the, the apostles need to take the gospel, uh, spread the good news from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth, and the book ends then with Paul preaching the gospel at the, in the heart of the empire, the city of Rome itself, the capital city, uh, so that now Jesus' uh, injunction has been fulfilled by the end of the book. Since this is the only surviving account of early Christianity that we have from the period, we might ask how accurate it is as a historical document. Scholars, in fact, have had reasons for questioning the historical accuracy of the book of Acts. There's a range of opinion on this among scholars. There are some scholars who think that Acts is highly reliable. There are some, think that, some who think that Acts is completely untrustworthy, and uh, most people are somewhere probably in the middle. There are good reasons, though, for doubting a number of the details of Acts account. And I'm going to look at two kinds of evidence. The first I'm going to do very briefly. It has to do with internal inconsistencies of the narrative. If you have a historical source, of course, you would hope that the, the source would be consistent with itself. That would show some basic concern, at least, for, for reliability. Acts uh, narrates, in several instances, the same event twice or three times. When it does so, often inconsistencies emerge. Uh, just to give you one example, uh, in Acts we have the conversion of Paul narrated in chapter 9. Paul narrates the events leading up to his conversion himself on two other occasions, once in chapter 22 and once in chapter 26. Unfortunately, these three accounts have minor inconsistencies between them that make you question uh, the, whether the author is really striving to give a disinterested account of what really happened. You can read these accounts for yourselves and just do a careful comparison. This is a sort of a classic instance of inconsistency. Paul is traveling with some companions. Well, his companions, the, the way it works is Paul sees this bright light. He falls to the ground. He hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And uh, he has this conversation with Jesus. He's blinded by the light, and, uh, but then he comes to realize that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Well, he had some companions with him. Did his companions hear the voice of Jesus but not see him, or did they see this light that, uh, that was Jesus but hear nothing? Well, it depends which of the accounts you're reading. It's just the opposite between chapter 9 and chapter 22. Were these companions left standing because they didn't see anything, or were they knocked to the ground with Paul? Well, it depends if you're reading chapter 9 or chapter 24. Minor little inconsistencies that might suggest that the author is not principally concerned with giving a completely accurate account of what really happened. More important, though, is that there are inconsistencies between this account and other accounts that we have of the same events. Luckily, we have a number of writings by Paul himself in the New Testament. Paul sometimes talks about his own life 
Acts talks about his life, and so we can compare the two. It's striking that whenever you compare what Paul says about himself and what Acts says about himself, they seem to differ. Just give you a couple of examples. Right after Paul's conversion in the book of Acts, he's in Damascus, he's been converted. When he leaves Damascus, where does he immediately go? He goes to Jerusalem to talk to the apostles. Acts chapter 9. That's striking because Paul also talks about what happened to him after he converted in Galatians chapter 1. And in Galatians 1, Paul is completely insistent that when he came to believe in Jesus, quote, I did not go to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before me. Paul makes a big point that he didn't go to Jerusalem for three years. Now, Paul has his own reason for insisting on this. His own reasons are that he doesn't want anybody to think that he got his gospel message from the apostles. He got it straight from God in a revelation from Jesus. He proves that by, by pointing out to people in Galatians, I didn't even go to Jerusalem right away. But in Acts, that's exactly what he does. Uh, well, that would be a kind of inconsistency. There's this conference in Acts, chapter 15, wh uh, which is meant to decide whether Gentiles have to be circumcised. According to Acts, this is Paul's third trip to Jerusalem. Paul is insistent in Galatians, chapters 1 and 2, that it's his second trip. He doesn't want people to think that he's been going back and forth to Jerusalem a lot. At this conference, was there widespread agreement among everybody who was there that, in fact, Gentiles don't have to be circumcised? That's what Acts 15 indicates. Paul seems to indicate that he had to twist some arms in a back room, Galatians chapter 2, to get the apostles to agree. These are kinds of inconsistencies you find between Paul and the book of Acts. Another one that uh, has struck scholars over the years is the content of Paul's preaching, the content of Paul's proclamation to Gentiles. We have sermons in the book of Acts uh, where Paul tries to convert pagans to believe. And Paul himself refers to what he preached. It's interesting to compare the two. In Acts chapter 17, Paul is uh, preaching to a group of philosophers on the Areopagus uh, in Athens. And Paul tells these people, these philosophers, that God has overlooked the ignorance of idolatry. Paul says that uh, people committed idolatry because they didn't know any better, and since they didn't know any better, God has overlooked it. But now they have a chance to realize that they've been wrong and to turn to God. In Romans chapter 1, Paul also talks about, about idolatry. But in Romans 1, it's very clear, Paul does not think that it's a, a, an act of ignorance. People who commit idolatry, who worship idols, according to Romans 1, don't do so out of ignorance. They do so out of willfulness. They know precisely that there's only one God. They worship idols because they reject the one God, and because this is an act of the will and knowledge, God condemns people who do this. It's just the opposite message that Paul gives in Acts chapter 17. Now, it may be that Paul simply changed his message depending on his audience, or he may, um, maybe you could conclude that in Acts 17 he's preaching what he doesn't really think. I suppose that's possible. It's also possible that Acts has one perspective on Paul, and Paul has a different perspective on Paul. How accurate is the book of Acts? Well, as I said, there's a spectrum of opinion. In my opinion, the book of Acts is about as accurate on Paul as the book of Luke is on Jesus. There's some historically accurate material here, but there's also been changes as this author has, uh, has attempted to provide a narration of the events. I think it would be a mistake, though, to discount the book of Acts for this reason. Just as the Gospels are not trying to give a disinterested historical sketch of Jesus' life for modern-day scholars, so to act is not trying to give a disinterested historical sketch of the early church. Like the Gospels, it's trying to explain the significance of what happened in early Christianity. It's not trying to provide some kind of data-driven, dry report. 
Acts, in fact, is a literary text with theological motifs. The literary character of Acts can be seen in a number of ways. This author is, in fact, uh, someone who is skilled in writing literature. It's interesting, for example, to compare Luke and Acts, the narratives of Jesus and the early church, because there are a number of similarities that the author has obviously put in there intentionally. Jesus, in the book of Luke, is baptized and he receives the Spirit. In the book of Acts, the believers in Jesus are baptized, they receive the Spirit. After Jesus receives the Spirit in the book of Luke, he's empowered to do miracles, and so he heals the sick, he casts out demons, he raises the dead. In the book of Acts, the apostles of Jesus, after they receive the Spirit, can do miracles. They heal the sick, they cast out demons, they raise the dead. In the book of Luke, Jesus is opposed by the Jewish authorities. In the book of Acts, his followers are opposed by the Jewish authorities. In the book of Luke, because he's rejected by the Jews, Jesus' message goes to the Gentiles. In Acts, because the apostles are rejected by the Jews, their message goes to the Gentiles. There's literary artery going on here in parallels between Luke and Acts. This literary character of the book of Acts needs to be taken seriously because it shows that this book is not trying simply to give the raw facts of history, but is trying to paint the history of early Christianity in theological hues. I want to uh, spend the rest of this lecture just detailing some of the theological emphases that one finds in the book of Acts, understanding that this is a, attempting to be a theological account. This author wants to emphasize that the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus was made possible by the power of God. This is a major theological point of his. It's because the Holy Spirit of God has come upon the church that the mission is made possible. The early Christian evangelists and missionaries are not acting on their own. They're empowered from on high. For that reason, according to this author, the Christian mission cannot be stopped. This is another overarching motif. People try to shut down this mission, especially the Jewish leaders, but they can't do it because God's behind it. At one place, early in the narrative of Acts, chapter 5, uh, one of the uh, Jewish leaders stands up and says uh, that we shouldn't oppose this movement because if it's not from God, then it'll fail. But if it is from God and we oppose it, then we'll be opposing God. That's the theme of this, motif, uh, that's the theme of this book. That in fact, if you oppose the Christian mission, you're opposing God. The proclamation in this book comes first to the Jewish people, many of whom uh, accept it and convert, but most of whom reject it. This author wants to emphasize, though, that there's nothing in the proclamation that stands contrary to the Jewish religion itself. The rejection of this message, though, by the Jews leads to its acceptance by the Gentiles. The mission then spreads not just geographically as it moves out from Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria and on into Gentile lands, it also spreads in what we might say ethnically from Jews to Samaritans who are thought to be sort of half Jews on to Gentiles. The Gentiles who accept this message do not need to be circumcised in order to receive it. A Gentile does not have to be a Jew in order to be a Christian. Uh, that's, a, that's an important point for this book because there are a lot of early Christians, of course, who thought uh, completely otherwise. The spread of the church for this author is going according to the plan of God. One implication of that is that, according to this author, God never intended the end to come right away. The message is de-apocalypsized a bit. The end wasn't supposed to come right away, because the church first had to be formed. Behind it all, of course, for this author is God himself. These are theological views, not historical data. Historians who want to know what actually happened during the early years of Christianity therefore need to approach the text of Acts critically. They have to apply criteria to this text, much as we apply criteria to the Gospels, to figure out, figure out what really happened. It's best to understand this book as a kind of theologically driven narrative of the spread of early Christianity. So, in conclusion, 
This book of Acts is our first historical sketch of the early Christian movement that traces the spread of the church from Jew to Gentile. Its main players are Peter at the beginning and Paul throughout most of the narrative. The book continues many of the themes that we found in the Gospel of Luke. In particular, the book is far less concerned to provide historically accurate data from modern historians who are interested in the brute facts of early, the early Christian movement than it is to give a theological sketch uh, of, of what this movement was all about. But the characters in this book are all historical figures, the most significant of whom is the Apostle Paul. In our next lecture, we'll turn to Paul himself to learn about this person that most scholars would agree is the most important figure in early Christianity outside of Jesus. Thank you for listening on Second Chance Ministry.